All right, Agile Design Systems with Vue. Um, my slides are here. I also tweeted them. So if you're interested in following along or getting ahead or going and taking a nap and reading them later, uh, you're welcome to. Um, I put in a, an animated SVG just to keep up with the other designers here, but that's apropos of nothing. Um, this is me. I'm Miriam. I work for Oddbird. Uh, Jacob was kind enough to donate some slides. Um, <laughs> I'm not a staff developer. Well, I could be. We don't really have job titles. Uh, I co-founded the company. Um, I can call myself whatever I want. So I'm the uh, CEO, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. This is my company. Uh, I started it with my brothers. Uh, we're a small consulting firm. I think this is our first client project uh, in 94. Um, now we're a slightly larger team. It's been going for a while doing consulting work. So that's an introduction to me. I guess uh, in CSS circles, I'm known for this thing, which is a grid system called Suzy. And uh, Sarah was like, people aren't going to know what that is. Show them the downloads. And I was like, no, I don't want them to use it. Um, <laughs> you should use CSS grids. So ignore that. Uh, we're going to talk more about Herman, which is my latest project, which is a design system generator. Um, and uh, I'm really just using it as an example of how we do this. Uh, and how we came to building this. Um, so it may not be the right tool for you, but uh, it's the tool that we've figured out for what we're doing. Um, so we're going to start with, like, you know, why? What are we, what are we even doing here? Um, you might have seen the Lightning Design System from Salesforce. It uh, came out a couple of years ago. Really beautiful. Uh, they've got a full-time team, uh, amazing people working on it. Um, it's got everything, including uh, this motion design section uh, by Kylo Ren, um, who you saw earlier. Uh, they did just amazing work. But they had a full-time team working on that uh, and a budget for it. And not all of us have that when we're working on a design system. So that's why I'm here today, to talk about how we do it with six people on a tight budget for a client. Um, you may also, in this community, know this. This is sort of a pre-existing design system that you can plug into and use. I'm not going to go into that much, because I'm going to talk about building your own. Uh, so design systems can include color palettes, or grid systems, or spacing and sizes, uh, or the letter M. Um, that one comes from the New York City Transit Authority Graphic Standards Manual, uh, which I got once. It came out in 1970. So this isn't a new idea. We've had these for a while. Uh, that also has the letter N, the numbers 5 through 8, and this page, which is why I'm here. Uh, this is how you build the sign that the letter M will appear on uh, in the subway. So that's what we need to know. How am I going to build it in a consistent way so that the letter M is always there? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so design systems, you might hear a lot of these terms thrown around, design systems, pattern libraries, style guides. Uh, they are all slightly different, and they are all part of the same thing. Design systems are sort of the overarching idea. Um, a design system often includes all of the other things that you'll hear about. Um, but uh, something to remember. Um, from my position where I don't have a dedicated team and a dedicated budget always, is that you got to start somewhere. Uh, so don't feel like you have to jump into all of the pieces all at once uh, right from the start. Um, basically, we need to know what are the components that we've got. And we have to have access to them so that we can do something with them. And then we need instructions of how we're going to use them. How are we going to put them together to build something? What are we trying to build? We're also going to need tools that help us, I don't know, doorstop? Is that a doorstop? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so a design system is always going to be an integration of design and code. Uh, it's never one or the other. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have uh, one team doing it. Uh, it's sort of uh, everybody is involved in, in a design system. Because it's not just how does the letter M look, it's also how are we going to build the sign behind the letter M 
Uh, those are both part of the system. So you can see here in the lightning design system, they have uh, not just what the icon looks like, but also what is the code that I'm going to use to make that icon. But we can ignore that because we're not mail force or sales chimp or any of the other things, <laughs> unless you are, some of you are. Uh, so we're gonna have to find our own ways to do it. And we actually have really different constraints and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, there's similar problems, but you know, our team size makes a difference. The team structure makes a difference. We don't have walls anywhere between our, I mean, it's six of us. Uh, there's not really a design team that goes off and then throws stuff over a wall. We're just all working together. Um, we're consulting, which means we have to move through projects quickly um, and often make the design system be a byproduct that just happens uh, as part of our process um, because clients don't have the time or budget to pay for it special. So we're trying to figure out how do we give them this thing that's gonna be useful uh, as quickly and, and simply as possible. Also, if it's 1970, you're gonna do it a little differently. You're gonna put it in a book uh, and sell it to designers who are suckers. So we've got a team of six, um, which I think I've already said too many times. So we're trying to build tiny bootstraps for every client. It's a different project every time. Uh, the project has different requirements. We're not gonna be able to use a plug and play system. We're gonna need to rebuild it every time, but and it's gonna have to fit them and it's gonna have to be uh, customized. Um, so the first step of that is just thinking about code patterns. <clears throat> How do we take code that feels meaningless when you look at it, uh, a big string of numbers there for a grid system, and how do we turn them into code that's meaningful so that both, the machine already understands both, how do we make it so that humans also understand it? Uh, Sarah Drasner likes to say code is communication, or she said it once, and I like to say it, so I quote her. Um, but also communication is communication, uh, so adding documentation to something is also useful in addition to having the code be more readable itself. Um, and both of these can have separate purposes. Um, in my experience, running the grid system, Susie, uh, I found that if I didn't document something, it didn't exist in people's minds. And I think that's consistent. Um, if you have patterns in your, in your application and you don't tell other people that those patterns exist, those patterns no longer exist two hours later. So uh, documenting it is what makes it a pattern. So where we start for a design system is we'll start by doing a design audit if we have an existing tool. Um, if we're working from scratch, we can skip this step uh, and start figuring out what we're gonna need instead of what's already there. Um, so that can happen just by going through your app and taking screenshots of components at various sizes, like what's the, okay, buttons would be something. We could look at all the buttons across the app. Um, this is a screenshot compilation that Brad Frost put together with all the buttons on his bank's website. Um, so then you can start organizing these and figure out, okay, which of these buttons do we actually need? Uh, and which of these buttons can we get rid of, just in terms of the, the design patterns underlying them. Uh, another useful thing to look into is CSS stats. I actually ran the Vue.js site through it. Um, this is what I found. Uh, it gives you sort of the statistics of your CSS. Uh, there's all the unique colors found on the page. You can find some of them aren't that unique, um, particularly those two greens that are basically identical. Um, and that happens, that's, you know, we copy and paste somewhere and uh, something gets changed and it doesn't get updated somewhere else. Um, and that can be cleaned up easily. This is, this, is not, uh, this is not a bad situation like that was. Um, good work, Chris. Um, you know, but also there's lots of font sizes here and uh, several of them seem to be slight variations on the same thing, uh, which sometimes is useful. Pixels are different than rems. Uh, but sometimes you can clean that up and come down to fewer font sizes. So uh, once you have a sense of what's there or uh, once you're starting on a new project, you can think instead about what are we actually gonna need, uh, what font sizes will it require to build a site like this, what buttons will it require. Um, so we'll move on from there. 
Design tokens, this is a term that the Lightning design system came up with and it's been catching on. Basically, it's the uh, abstractions. Um, so colors exist outside of their use, right? Uh, so colors as an abstraction would be a design token. Um, and really, start anywhere. Uh, for our first clients that we were starting to give them style guides, um, we just gave them colors. Uh, that was all we documented because we figured out how to document that well first. Um, and then we slowly started adding in more and more elements to that. Uh, CSS was designed for patterns um, and it sort of gives us this triangle. Uh, this is what the cascade is designed for. Um, and this comes from Harry Roberts inverted triangle CSS. If you don't like his, you can use my right side up triangle CSS. Uh, it's very similar, but the idea is that uh, broad reaching tokens or um, tokens are gonna be used everywhere, right? So colors are gonna be applied to everything. They have a broad reach. Uh, and as much as possible, we wanna have the majority of our code be in that broad reach. And then we have less and less code as we get more specific. Uh, so you can think about that in layers, uh, settings, tools, uh, how do we get in more and more specific? We get down to the bottom, he had trumps, I was like, no way, so I called that overrides, because <laughs> we're not talking about designing for one guy with orange hair, we're not even talking just about these people or these people, we're dealing with everybody, um, so no trumps, uh, we've got overrides. But then I tried to put in a little more detail here. These first two layers, I always try to keep those output free. Um, so that means in SAS, those are just variables and mix-ins and functions, uh, and they have no output. I can pull them into any CSS file, and nothing in the file will change unless I ask it to, uh, unless I actually do something with it. Um, and that just makes those core configurations, those design tokens, uh, completely mobile um, from one place to the next. You can pull them in anywhere. And then if you're thinking about scope styles in Vue, uh, they belong at the peak of this triangle. They're useful, uh, but their place is to target things really explicitly, and that should be the minority of what we're doing, hopefully. Uh, like I said, CSS was designed for patterns. That's what classes are. If we look at their system, it's entirely based on class CSS hooks uh, like this, SLDS icon, SLDS icon text warning. Um, this is a system of classes. Uh, I think that can be, uh, so yeah, here they give, give you basically the API, the class API list. Uh, this is what you can apply to your icons to get different looks. Um, classes are for pattern making, they are part of how we uh, build these things, and naming things is hard, but they're there. Um, the cascade is also for patterns, that's why we have the triangle. But let's look at actually, so we've got three colors here. <coughs> how are we gonna represent them? Um, one popular way is just uh, SAS variables, and that makes sense. Um, they're simple, uh, straightforward, uh, it's the first thing we got. Um, we've seen them used uh, by other people here, um, and they're great. Uh, they require minimal tooling. You just need SAS, the variables will work. Um, they're not meaningfully organized, so if I have uh, 30 color variables, I either have to uh, sort of give them a f sense of namespacing in how I uh, name the variables, but that doesn't actually group them in any way. Uh, there's no meaningful organization here. Variables can get added anywhere and moved around. It encourages sort of adding one-offs. Um, so it's not quite the structure that we want for a design system necessarily. And it's difficult to do anything automated with it. Uh, the machine doesn't know which variables are colors unless we tell it explicitly. Uh, coming down the pipeline and actually working in most browsers, uh, we have CSS variables. They're super rad but they have some of the same problems. Um, they, there's no organized grouping there except for scope. What they do uh, that SAS variables can't do just quickly is that they inherit. 
uh, so they understand the NOM structure, and there's a lot of power to that, but that's a different talk. So where we landed was with SAS maps, which were built for, uh, I need lots of different uh, tokens that are all part of one system. They're grouped in a meaningful way. Uh, I can give them keys and values. I can manipulate them programmatically, uh, but then they fall apart as soon as I try to do reference within the map and make adjustments. Uh, so that's not great. This was the first error we ran into with that um, undefined variables. Colors doesn't exist at the time that we're trying to manipulate it. Um, so we had to figure something out. So we came up with this syntax. It's our own syntax, uh, and we had to build tooling around it. This is not something inherent to SAS, but we just sort of list out what adjustments are we going to want to make down the road. Uh, and then that's great, we've got sort of meaningful reference in there, Kevin Bacon references back to Bach and good old Nesher uh, up to the brand color. Um, but it doesn't do anything until we give it some tooling. Um, so we built some tools, uh, a recursive function here that can go look up one key and then keep looking for keys until it finds the right uh, starting place and then build the colors uh, down the chain. Um, and then that's all uh, actually compiled when the compiler runs. Uh, so the colors, uh, the, we, the colors are never calculated until we're actually running the compiler, which makes them dynamic in some ways. There's some interesting things you can do, but basically now you call Kevin Bacon uh, through our color function and you get the color. It's more tooling. Um, that's a trade-off that we always have to consider. Um, that's true with most of the tools we use, uh, say Vue, for example. Um, and you know we're writing tests for it and there's testing frameworks you can use in SAS if you are writing that kind of logic. Uh, plug it into Mocha or something and get some nice output. But with that system, we can start to then break down our tokens into more layers and say, okay, we not only have colors, we have sort of these brand colors that we don't ever wanna use directly but everything else is based on them. And then at the next level, we've got sort of theme colors which is how we're adjusting them for this theme. And then at the next level, we've got component colors, which is actually applying those to specific. Uh, so you could say, okay, well, uh, our, here's our brand colors, here's what we're using for text. Um, then you could say, well, actually, but links we're gonna wanna have be uh, an action color. Um, so you can have these different layers even within that. Uh, the relationships remain dynamic. Uh, similar to the talk yesterday about uh, having the reactive, uh, the reactive store, um, being able to uh, modify uh, when you change one color, that change propagates down through all the colors. Um, so that's kind of fun, but uh, not often needed. Uh, another approach that people have used to group colors is something like this. It's using a YAML file. Uh, this is, uh, there's a tool called Theo that comes from Lightning Design System that will read that YAML file and generate uh, SAS variables for you uh, based on the YAML files. And you can have YAML files for colors and sizes and whatever you need. And it's a great solution for them, particularly because they're exporting from YAML to not only SAS, but uh, iOS languages and Android languages. And uh, so they're taking this one single source of data and exporting it various places. We don't often need that. so keeping it in SAS makes more sense to us. Um, they also have some generic sort of reference within their maps, uh, but they can't do quite the same level of reference uh, because YAML doesn't understand what a color is in the way that SAS understands what a color is. Uh, so there's trade-offs there again. Uh, it's easier to export from YAML, but it's not actually a style language. It's not made for this. So we've got to know the trade-offs. Um, and then we want tools that help us use whatever system we're doing. Um, and this is where uh, we're really trying to make it so that everything we do can, uh, when I add a color, I want it to automatically update the style guide and know that that color is there. I want the, the machine, all of my tools to understand the same source of data uh, and generate everything from that source. Um, so we're gonna start from the structured code uh, which is that map, 
we're going to add some documentation to it, and we're using a uh, variant of SAS doc uh, that we've extended. We're calling it Herman, um, and Herman uh, takes the same syntax as SAS doc uh, and generates documentation from that. So it understands, I can say, okay, these, this map is colors, so show me the colors, and it does. Um, so now, anytime we update that map, and that map is the easiest place to add a color, so when developers add a color, they add it to the map. Uh, as soon as it's in the map, it shows up in the style guide. Um, and there, we don't uh, need the full team uh, working full time to build the style guide. You can also do that with uh, modular scales, font sizes, fonts. You can have ratios stored and display the ratios. You can have sizes stored and then, uh, you know, here's, I guess, using them. Um, and then it can understand that and it can render that. I can do the same thing with spacing. Um, you know, so we're building in these ways that the machine, both our tools as developers and the tool that generates the style guide, they understand the same source code uh, and they can both generate from that. Uh, it's both opinionated and not opinionated. Um, so thanks for a second slide, Jacob. Um, from there, we've got to define the API, and we're going to have different APIs depending on our needs. Lightning Design System has this class-based API. You'll notice there's no SAS in here. Um, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no templating language. This is pure HTML and CSS. And for them, that's because you can't count on anything else. They're distributing their components to companies all over the world that are working on different stacks, and all that they can count on is that everybody will have HTML and CSS. So that's what they ship. For us, if we're building an app for a client, we're determining the stack, and we can build a design system with an API that fits them and their needs. Um, so one thing that I would do in thinking even just about a class-based system or an HTML and CSS-based system, people complain that classes aren't namespaced. You can actually kind of fix that uh, by moving things into data attributes, and we do this a lot, because uh, the attribute then creates the namespace for us, and then we have only a certain set of options that are available in that attribute. So I would move uh, down to having a data SLDS icon color with then four options in it. And then now we know that all those four options are icon colors, uh, and they're part of the same pattern. You can do the same thing with their sizes. Um, you can also start playing with template logic uh, if you have that available, which you do in Vue, which is, hi, great. Um, so we can say, okay, well, I want this icon to be the check mark if we uh, had a success and an X otherwise. Um, oh, yeah, this is one of those uh, secrets that you've heard about. Uh, yeah. So uh, we can start building components which simplify. Um, oh, yeah, that's what I was referencing back to him for. Um, uh, the idea of being able to build a completely transparent component wrapper, uh, this is where that's useful. Now we can. Uh, have the icon, or uh, in that case, the form field um, be simplified, and we've hidden all of our accessibility code, all of our HTML, all of our patterns inside of it, and we just provide uh, a few properties that give us um, the variations on the pattern. So you get consistency and accessibility as long as you spend the time building inconsistency and accessibility into the patterns, which you have to do. Um, we also do a thing where we can uh, run down through a folder of SVG icons and just render all of them. Um, that doesn't work great yet with the uh, icon recipe that's in the view cookbook. Uh, I want to figure that out because I'm starting to use that recipe and I want this. So we'll be working on that feature. Right now we support nunjucks for uh, rendering components, displaying components. Because we have such a SAS first approach, it's a little bit of a weird thing where we have to call the component from our SAS documentation uh, to have it render. We've been using, we're a Python team, we've been using Jinja and Nunjucks. Um, 
And so we've built that in where we can r render nunjux macros uh, from this. But it'd be really nice to get that working for view components as well, and that's something that we're working on. In the meantime, yeah, this is what we generate uh, from the macro, so we can show you the input code and the output code. Um, but yeah, SAS first breaks down. There's uh, other tools out there that are framework first. Uh, and while I think we do a better job sometimes at the uh, design tokens, they tend to do a better job at integrating directly with a framework. Um, and this is a fairly recent one that came out for Vue uh, and looks pretty nice. I haven't used it extensively, but I like what I've seen. Um, and for them, you just add a docs tag uh, in your single file components and uh, you can write some documentation there and you can call components uh, and have them rendered. It looks very similar. So uh, there's lots of tools trying to do these same things um, in different systems. Uh, and all of them are probably good depending on your situation. I would like both. I would like a system that uh, both generates from my SAS for the design tokens and uh, from my uh, templating language um, for documenting that side of patterns, and we haven't quite solved that yet, but we're working on it. So you made it through to my conclusion. Automation is essential. Basically, we started adding these things slowly because it took us a while to figure out how to automate each thing uh, while we were doing our actual client work. Um, and that automation is what makes it not die uh, because keeping a design system up to date is more important than having it. Um, if it goes out of date, bad documentation, wrong documentation is gonna take you in the wrong direction uh, faster than no documentation. So uh, we really wanted to make sure that we're building things that are going to stay updated. They're gonna be integrated in, into developer process. Uh, they're gonna start from meaningfully structured code. Um, they're gonna have inline documentation so that uh, the docs get updated right where the developers are already. They're not having to go look somewhere else to write the docs. Um, the tools are built in. They encourage uh, the documentation. Um, they automate as much of the documentation as possible. They're part of the process. They're not an add-on. Uh, and then, you know, We've got our pieces, we can click them together. We've got a website, we wear our helmets because there's dragons. And then all of our numbers go up. So that's the thing. Thank you.